Good morning. It's Friday, the 16th of February. The Black Man Read Aloud Hour. This is the Black Man celebrating and reading the Black Masters as I celebrate uh, Black history. Today we're going to read um, the, the Black of the Berry. It was written by Wallace Thurman. Let's tell you a little bit about Wallace Thurman. Wallace was born August 16, 1902 in Salt Lake City, Utah, the son of Beulah Jackson and Oscar Thurman, and was raised by his mother and grandmother in Utah. His parents had been divorced in the year of Thurman's birth. His mother was married at least six times. His father he scarcely knew in his adult years except for an encounter in 1929. His maternal grandmother, Emma Jackson, Ma Jack, kept a tavern and engaged in bootlegging activities at various times. Wallace was a vivacious reader at an early age. He attended high school in Omaha, Nebraska, where he had gone with his mother before returning to Salt Lake City, where he graduated from West Salt Lake High School. He spent two years as a pre-med student at the University of Art. Utah, and after a hiatus, he enrolled in 1922 in a journalism program at the University of Southern California. He apparently dropped out after one semester after leaving school. Wallace was employed as an associate editor of the Los Angeles newspaper, The Pacific Defender. He also worked as a postal clerk, forming a friendship with fellow postal worker on Edmo Thames. Thurman founded the outlet described um, as the first Western Negro literary magazine of which he published six issues. No copies are said to have survived. After the failure of the magazine, Wallace moved to New York City, arriving in Harlem in the fall of 1925 and renewing his friendship with Bo Thames, who found him a room in the same boarding house where he was staying. Plagued by ill health, Thurman supported himself with difficulty. In a 1928 letter to Claude McKay, he wrote, I came to Harlem knowing one individual. Since then, I've struggled and starved and had a hell of a good time generally. Along with Nella Lawson, Arnold, du Arnold Douglas, and other Harlem writers and artists, he attended Gene Thomas' workshop on Gerdeff's teachings. The audience loved Lewis, whose short-lived magazine, The Looking Glass, Thurman had worked as a writer and editorial assistant, found Thurman as an, an, an editorial position at The Messenger, to which he also contributed articles and reviews. He played the leading role in editing the literary journal Fire in 1926, whose other editors were Langston Hughes and Zara Neil Hurston and Richard Bruce Nugent and Gwendolyn Bennett and John P. Davis and Aaron Douglas. Only one issue appeared in November 1926. It, it was controversial due in part to the sexual frankness of Eugene Smokes. Smoke, Lillian, Jade, and Thurman Story, Cordella, The Crude. The, the print room was almost completely destroyed in an apartment fire, and Thurman bore most of the burden of the magazine's considerable financial losses. Also in November of 1926, Thurman moved into an apartment at 267 West 136th Street, nicknamed Niggeria Manor, which he shared with artist and writer Richard Bruce Nugent, which became a social center frequented by Hughes and Hurston and Dorothy West and others. Another journal launched by Thurman in 1928, Harlem, a journal of Negro life, published only a single issue. His article, Negro Life in New York's Harlem, was published in the Harlem and Julius Little Blue Book series in 1928. In August of 1928, he married Louise Thomas, but the marriage broke up within six months or perhaps weeks. Thomas would later remark of Thurman that he took nothing seriously. He laughed about everything. He would often threaten to commit suicide, but he, he you knew he never tried. He would never admit he was a homosexual. He, he worked as an editor at McFadden Publishers and contributed stories to True Story under pseudonyms. His novel, The Black and the Berry, was published by Macaulay Company in February of 1929. And that's the book we're going to read today. Um, and um, <clears throat> Thurman went to Hollywood in February of 1934 and wrote...
stories for two low-budget low films, Tomorrow's Children and High School uh, Girl. He returned to New York in poor health, and that was probably brought on by heavy drinking and, and following a diagnosis of acute tu tuberculosis. Wallace entered City Hospital on Welfare Island, where he died on December 22, 1930s. 1934. And we're going to be reading uh, chap part one, Emma Lou, from The Black of the Berry. More acutely than ever before, Emma Lou knew, began to feel that her luscious black complexion was somewhat of a liability, and her marked color variation from the other people in her environment was a decided curse, not not that she minded being black, being a Negro necessitated having a colored skin, but she did not be she did she did not mind she did mind being too black. She couldn't understand why such should be the case, couldn't comprehend the cruelty of the NATO attenders attenders who had allowed her to be dipped, as it were, in indigo ink where when there were so many more pleasing colors on, on nature's palette. Biolog biologically it wasn't necessary either. Her, her mother was quite fair, so was her mother's mother and her mother's brother, and, and her mother's brother, brother's son, but then none of them had a black man for a father. Why had her mother married a black man? Surely there had been some eligible brown-skinned men around. She didn't particularly desire to have a high yellow father, but for her sake certainly some more happy medium could have been found. She wasn't the only person who regretted her darkness either. It was an acquired family characteristic, this moaning and grieving over color of her skin. Everything possible had been done to alleviate the unhappy condition. Every suggested agent had been employed, but her skin, despite bleaching, scorching, and powdering, had remained black, fast black, as nature had planned and affected. She would have been born a boy she should, she should have been born a boy, then color of skin wouldn't have mattered so much. But wasn't her mother always saying that a black boy could get along, but a black girl would never know anything but sorrow and disappointment? But she wasn't a boy. She was a girl. And the color did matter. It mattered so much that she would rather have missed receiving her high school diploma than have to sit as she, as she now sat the only odd and conspicuous figure on the auditorium platform of the boys' high school. Why had she allowed them to place her in the center of the first row? And why had they insisted upon dressing entirely on, in white so that surrounded as she was by similarly attired pale-faced fellow graduates, she resembled not at all remotely that comic picture of her Uncle Joe that had hung in his bedroom, the picture wherein the black kinky head of a little red lip picnicky lay like a fly in a pan of milk amid a white expanse of bedclothes. But of course, she couldn't have worn blue or black when the car was for wearing of white, even if white was not complimentary to her complexion. She would have been odd looking anyway, no matter what she wore, and she would have been conspicuous for not only what she was before, she was the only dark-skinned person on the platform. She was the only Negro pupil in the entire school and had been for the past four years. Well, thank goodness the principal would soon be through with this monotonous farewell, farewell address and she and other members of her class would advance to the platform center as their names were called and received the documents which would signify their unconditional release from public school. As she thought of these things, Emma Lou glanced at those who sat to her right and the left of her. She envied them in their obvious elation, yet felt a strange sense of superiority because of her immunity for a moment from an infirmarial mob emotion. Get a diploma. What did it mean to her? College? Perhaps a job? Perhaps again? She was going to have a high school diploma, but would it mean nothing to, but it would mean nothing to her whatsoever. The tragedy of her life was that she was too black. Her face and not the slender roll of ribbon-bound parchment was to be her future identification tag in society. High school diploma, indeed. What she needed was an efficient bleaching agent, a magic cream that would remove this unwelcome blast mask, black mask from her face and make her more like her fellow men. Emma Lou Morgan? 
She, she came to with a start. The principal then called her name and stood smiling down at her benevolently. So someone, she knew it was her cousin Buddy, stupid imp, applauded very faintly, very provocatively. Someone even else snickered. Emma Lou Morgan? The principal had called her name again more sharply than before, and his smile was less benevolent. The girl who sat to her left of her nudged her. There was nothing else for her to do but to get out of that anchoring chair and march forward to receive her diploma. But why did the people in the audience have to stare so? Didn't they all know that Emma Lou Morgan was Boyce High School's only nigger student? Didn't they all know? What was the use? She had to get that diploma, so summoning her most insignificant manner, she advanced to the platform stage, but every muscle of her left limbs in the play heartily extended her shiny black arm to receive the proper diploma. Bound a chilly thanks, then holding her arm stiffly at her sides, insolently returned to her seat in that foreboding white line, instantly returning once more to slotch its pale purity and to mock it with her dark outlandish difference. Emma Lou had been born in a semi-white world, totally surrounded by an all-white one, and in those dark elements that had forced their way in had either been shooed away or else greeted with diversive laughter. It was a custom always of those with whom she came into most frequent contact to ridicule or revile any black person or object. A black cat was a harbinger of bad luck. A black crepe was an insignia of mourning, and black people were, e were either evil niggers or poisonous blue gums or else typical vaudeville darkies. It seemed as if the people in her world never went halfway in their recognition or reception of things black. For these things always seemed always to call forth only the most extreme emotional reactions. They never provoked mere smiles or mere melancholy. Rather, they would signal either for boisterous guffaws or pain induced and tear attended grief. Emma Lou had become in, had been had been becoming increasingly aware of this for a long time, but her immature mind would had never completely grasped its fall into her tragic significance. First, there had been the case of a father, old black Jim Morgan, they called him, and Emma Lou had often wondered why it was, why it was that he, of all the people she had heard discussed by her family, should always, always, always be referred to as if his very blackness condemned him to receive no respect from his fellow man. She also began to wonder if it was because of his blackness that he had never been in evidence as far as he, as far as she knew. Inquiries netted very unsatisfactory answers. Your father is no good. He left your mother, deserted her shortly after you were born. And those statements were always prefixed or followed by some epitaph such as dirty black no gooder or darn his ornery black hide. There was, in fact, only one member of his family who did not speak of his father in that manner, and that was her Uncle Joe, who was also the only person in the family to whom she really felt akin, because he alone never seemed to regret nor bemoan or to ridicule her blackness of skin. It was her grandmother who did all the regretting, her mother who did all the bemoaning, her cousin Buddy, and her playmates, both white and colored, who did the ridiculing. Emma Lou's maternal grandparents, Samuel and Maria Lightfoot, both mulatto products of slave day, promiscuity between males, masters, and female chattel, neither had been slaves, their own parents having been granted their freedom because of their rather close connections with the right branch of the family tree. These freemen had migrated into Kansas with their children, and when these children had grown up, they in turn had joined the Westwood Hole parade of that current era and finally settled in Boise, Idaho. Samuel and Maria, like many others of their kind and their descendants, had only one compelling desire, which motivated their every activity and dictated their every thought. They wished to be put as much, they wished to put as much physical and mental space between them and the former home of their parents as was possible. That was why they left Kansas. For in Kansas, there, there were too many reminders of that which their parents had escaped and from which they had wished to flee. Kansas was too near 
the former slave belt too accessible to disgruntled southerners who deprived of their slaves were incalculated with easily communicable virus nigger hatred. Then too in Kansas all niggers were Negroes were considered as belonging to one class. It didn't matter if you and your parents had been free men before the Emancipation Proclamation, nor did it matter that you were almost three quarters white. You were nevertheless classed with those hordes of hungry, ragged, ignorant black folk arriving from the South in such great numbers, packed like so many stampeding cattle and dirty manure littered boxcars. From all these maternal grandparents, from all of this, these maternal grandparents of Emma Lou fled to the Rocky Mountain states, which were too far away for the recently freed slaves to reach, especially since most of them believed that the world ended just a few miles north of the Mason-Dixon line. Then, too, not only were the Rocky Mountain states beyond the reach of this raunchous and smelly rabble of recently freed cotton pickers and plantation hands, but they were also peopled by pioneers, sturdy land and gold seekers from the east marching westward, always westward in search of El Dorado, and being too busy in this respect to be violently roused by the problems of race unless economic factors precipitated matters. So Martha and Samuel went into the fast fair and the farness of a little known Rocky Mountain territory and settled in Boise. At the time, nothing more than a trading station for the Indians and whites and a red light center for the cowboys and sheep herders and miners in the neighboring vicinity. Samuel went into the saloon business and grew prosperous. Maria raised a family and began to mother nuclear elements for a future select Negro social group. There was, of course, in such a small, haphazardly populated community, some social intermixture between whites and blacks. White and black gamblers, ro gamblers rolled the dice together, played tricks on one another while dealing pharaoh, and became allies in their attempts to outfigure the roulette wheel. White and black men amicably frequented the saloons and dance halls together. White and black women leaned out of the doorways and windows of the jerry-built frame houses and log cabins of Horro. White and black housewives gossiped over back fences and lent one another needed household commodities. But there was little social intercourse on a higher scale. Slewfoot Sal, the most popular high yellow on Horro, might be a buddy to Irish Peg and Blonde Liz, but Mrs. Amos James, whose husband owned the town's only dry goods school, dry goods store, could certainly not become too familiar with Miss Samuel Lightfoot Colored, whose husband owned the saloon, and it was not the matter of difference in their respected husbands' businesses. Mrs. Amos James did associate with Mr. Mrs. Arthur Emery White, whose husband also owned the saloon. It was purely a matter of color. Emily's grandmother, then holding herself aloof from the inmates of Hoare Row and not wishing to associate with such as old Mammy Lewis' daughters, who did most of the town wash and others of their ilk, was forced to choose her social equals slowly and carefully. And this was hard, for there were so few Negroes in Boise anyway that were much, there wasn't much, to cream, to, much cream to skim off. But as the years passed, Others who, like Maria and her husband, were mulatto offsprings of mulatto freemen seeking a freer land moved in, and they were soon initiated into what later, to, later was to be known as the Blue Vein Circle, so named because all of its members were fair-skinned enough for their blood to be seen pulsating purple through the veins of their wrists. Emma Lou's grandmother was the founder and 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 the acknowledged leader of the Boise's Blue Veins, and she guarded its exclusiveness passionately and jealously. Were they not a superior class? Were they not a very high type of Negro, comparable to persons of the color group in the West Indies? And were they not entitled, if so facto, to more respect and opportunity? Uh, in social acceptance, social acceptance than the more pure-blooded Negroes. In their vein was some of the best blood in the South. They were closely akin to the only true aristocrats, uh, aristocrats in the United States. Even the slave masters have been aware of and acknowledged in some measure their superiority. 
having some of Mars Brown, Mars George's blood in their veins set them apart from the ordinary Negroes at birth. These mulattoes, as a rule, were not ordered to work in the fields beneath the broiling sun at the urge of a Simon Legree lash. They were saved and trained for the more gentle jobs, saved and trained to be ladies' maids and butlers. Therefore, let them continue this natural division of Negro society. Let them also guard against the unwelcome and degenerating encroachments. Their motto was, must be whiter and whiter every generation until the grandchildren of the blue veins could easily go over into the white race and become assimilated so that the problems of race would plague them no more. Maria had preached this doctrine to her two children, Jane and Joe, throughout their apprentice years and, 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 and can therefore be forgiven for having a physical, lap, physical collapse when they both, first Joe, then Emma Lou's mother, married not mulatto men but copper brown and a blue black. This had been somewhat of a necessity for when the maiden call had made itself heard to them, there had been no eligible blue veins around. Most of their youthful companions have been sent away to school or else to seek careers in eastern cities, and those few who have remained had already found their chosen life's companions. Maria had sensed that something of her kind might happen and had urged Samuel to send Jane and Joe away to some eastern boarding school, but Samuel was had very stubbornly refused. He had his own notions of the sort of things one children's learn, one's children learned in boarding schools and of the great opportunities they had to apply that learning. True, they might acquire the same knowledge in the public schools of Boise, but then there, had, there would be some limit to the extent to which they could apply this knowledge, seeing that they lived at home and pre-force must submit to some parental supervision. A cot in the attic at home was for Samuel a much safer place for a growing child to sleep than an on four poster in a boarding school dormitory. So Samuel had remained adamant that his two carefully reared scanions of Boise's first blue vein family had of, ne had of necessity sought their mates among the lower orders. However, Joe's wife was not as undesirable as Emma Lou's father, for she was almost three-quarters Indian, and there was a scant possibility that her children would have revolting dark skin, thick lips, spreading nostrils, and kinky hair. But in the case of Emma Lou's father, there was no extenuating characteristics for his physical properties undeniably stamped him as a four-blooded Negro. In fact, it seemed as if he had come from one of the families originally from Africa, who could not boast of having been seduced by some member of the Southern aristocracy or defended by some member of a strolling band of Indians. No one could understand why Emma Lou's mother had married Jim Morgan, least of all Jane herself. In fact, she hadn't thought much about it until Emma Lou had been born. She had first met Jim at a church picnic, given in a woodlawn meadow on the outskirts of the city, and almost before she had realized what was happening, she had found herself slipping away from home. Night after night, to stroll down a well-shaded shaded street known as Lover's Lane with a man her mother had forbidden, forbidden her to see, and it hadn't been too long before they decided that an elopement would be the only thing to ensure themselves the pleasure of being together without worrying about Mama Lightfoot's wrath. Talking of neighbors, prying town marshes, marshals and grace and grass stains. Despite the rancor of her mother and the whispering of her mother's friends, Jane hadn't found anything to regret in her choice of a husband until Emma Lou had been born. Then all the fears her mother had instilled in her about the penalties inflicted by society upon black Negroes, especially upon black Negro girls, came, came to the fore. She was abysmally stunned by the color of her child, for she had been certain that since she herself was so fair that her child could not certainly be as dark as its father, she had been certain that it would be a luscious admixture, a golden brown, with all its mother's desirable facial features and its mother's hair, but she hadn't reckoned with nature's perversity. Nor had she taken into consideration the unscapable fact that some of her ancestors too had been black and that some of her color chromosomes were still embedded within her. Emma Lou had been fortunate enough to have hair like her mother's, a thick, curly black mass of hair, 
rich and easy, easily controlled. But she had been unfortunate enough to have a face as black as her father and a nose which, while not exactly flat, was distinctly negroid as to her tooth, to as, as were her two thick lips. Her birth had served no good purpose. It had driven her mother back to seek the confidence and aid of Maria and had given Maria the chance she had been seeking to break up the undesirable union of her daughter with what she called a ordinary black nigger. But Jim's departure hadn't solved all solved matters at all. Rather, it complicated them. For, for although he was gone, his child remained a tragic mistake, which could not be stamped out or eradicated even after Jane, by getting a divorce from Jim and marrying a red-haired Irish Negro, had been ex had been accepted back into the blue blue vein grace. Emma Lou had been the alien member of the family, and of the family social circle. Her grandmother, now a widow, made her feel it. Her mother made her feel it, and her cousin Booty made her feel it. To say nothing of the way she regarded, she was regarded by outsiders. As early as she could remember, people had been saying to her mother, "What an extraordinary black child! Where did you adopt it? Or else, such a lovely, unniggerish hair on such a niggerish-looking child." Some even had been facetious and made suggestions like, "Try some lye, Jane. It might eat it out." She can't look any worse. Then her mother's remarriage had brought her and brought another person into her life, a person destined to give her, while still a young child, much pain and unhappiness. Anolia McNamara, no, McMara was his name. He was the bastard son of an Irish politician and a Negro washerwoman, and until he had been sent east to a parochial school, and Lois, so named because he that his so name because that was his father's middle name and had always been known as Lois Washington and the identity of his own father had never been revealed to him by his proud and humble mother. But since his father had been prevailed upon to pay for his education, Anoya's mother thought it was the proper time to tell his son his true origin and to let him assume his real name. She had hopes that away from his hometown he might be able to pass for white and march unhindered by bars of color to fame and fortune. But such was not the case, for Emma Lou's prospective stepfather was so conscious of the Negro blood in his veins and so bitter because of it that he used up whatever talents he had grow he had growingly inwardly at a con con capricious fate in planning revenge upon the world at large, especially the black world. For it was Negroes and not whites whom he blamed for his own, to him, life's tragedy. He was not fair enough of skin, despite his mother and his own hopes to pass for white. There was a brownness in his skin inherited from his mother, which immediately marked him out for what he was, despite the red hair and Irish blue eyes. And his facial features had been modeled too generously. He was not thin-lipped, nor were his nostrils as delicately chiseled as they might have been. He was a Negro. There was no way getting around it, although he tried in every way possible to do so. Finishing school, he had returned west to the Express for the express purpose of making his father accept him publicly and personally advance his career. He had wanted to be a lawyer and figured that his father's political pull uh, was sufficient was sufficiently strong to draw him beyond race barriers and set him up and set him apart. His father had not been entirely cold to these plans and proposals, but his father's wife had been. She didn't mind her husband giving this nigger bastard of his money and receiving him in his home on rare and private occasions. She was trying to be liberal, but she wasn't going to have people point at her and say, that's Boss McNamara's wife. One that that nigger son is his or hers. They, they, they do say. So Aloysius found himself stunned back into the black world he so despised. He couldn't be made to realize that being a Negro did not necessarily indicate that one must be a ne'er do well. Had he been white or so, he said he could have been a successful criminal lawyer, but being considered black, it was impossible for him ever to be anything more advanced than a Pullman carport or a diamond car, a dining car waiter, and acting upon this premise, he hadn't tried to be anything else. His only satisfaction in life was a pleasure he derived from insulting and ignoring the real blacks, persons of color, 
mulattoes were all right, but he couldn't stand detestable black Negroes. Unfortunately, Emma Lou fell into this latter class and suffered at his hands accordingly until she finally ran away from his wife, Emma Lou, Boise, Negroes and all, and ran away to Canada with Diamond Lil of Hoare Road. Summer vacation was nearly over and it had not yet been decided what to do with Emma Lou now that she had graduated from high school. She herself gave no help, nor offered any suggestions. As it was, she did not care what became of her. All it, all it, after all, it didn't seem to matter. There was no place in the world for a girl as black as she anyway. Her grandmother had assured her that she would never find a husband worth a dime, and her mother had said, again, said it again and again, oh, if you had only been a boy, until Emma Lou had often wondered why it was that people were not able to affect a change of sex or at least a change of complexion. It was her Uncle Joe who finally prevailed upon her to upon her mother to send her to the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. There, every reason she... She would find a larger and more intelligent social circle in a city the size of Los Angeles. There were Negroes of every class, color, and social position. Let Emma Lou go there where she would not be as far away from home as if she were to go to some eastern college. Jane and Maria, while not agreeing entirely with what Joe said, were nevertheless glad that there had something which seemed adequate and sensible could be done for Emma Lou. She was to take the four-year college course receive a bachelor's degree in education, then go south to teach. That, they thought, was a promising future. And for once in the 18 years of Emma Lou's life, everyone was satisfied of some measure. Even Emma Lou grew elated over the prospects of the trip. Her Uncle Joe's insistence upon the difference of social contacts in larger cities intrigued her. Perhaps he was right after all in continually reasserting to to them that as long as one was a Negro, one specific color had little to do with one's life. Salvation depended upon the individual. And he also told him, Lou, during one of their usual private talks, that the only that it was only in small cities one encountered stupid colored prejudice such as she had encountered among the blue vein circle in her own town. People in large cities, he said, are broad. They do not have time to think of petty things. The people in Boise are 50 years behind the time. But you will find that Los Angeles is one of the world's greatest and most modern cities, and you will be happy there. On arriving in Los Angeles, Emma Lou was very, was so busy observing the colored inhabitants that she had little time to pay attention to the other things. Palm trees and wild geraniums were pleasant to behold, and such Strange phenomena as pepper trees and century plants had to be admired, but they were very obvious, and they also were strange and beautiful, and they impinged upon only a small corner of Emma Lou's consciousness. She was minutely aware of them, necessarily took them, took them in while passing, viewing the totality without pondering over the lingering, over or lingering to praise their stylistic details. They were in this instant exquisite theater props, rendered in insignificant by a more strange and more beautiful human pageant. For Emma Lou, who in all her life had never seen over 500 Negroes, the spectacle presented by a community containing over 50,000 was sufficient to make the relatively commonplace many more important and charming things than the far-framed, famed natural scenery of Southern California. She had arrived in Los Angeles a week before registration day at the university and had spent her time being in being shown and seeing the city. But whenever she these sightseeing excursions took away from the sections where Negroes lived, she immediately lost all interest in what she was being shown. The Pacific Ocean in itself did not cause her heart to beat or quicken, nor did the roaring of its waves find an emotional echo within her. But on coming upon Bruce's Beach for colored people near Redondo or the little strip sandy shore that they had appropriated for themselves in Santa Monica, the Pacific Ocean became an intriguing something to complicate, to contemplate as a background for their activities. Everything was interesting as it was patronized, reflected through or acquired by Negroes. Her Uncle Joe had been right here in the colored social circles of Los Angeles. 
Emma Lou was certain that she would find many suitable companions, intelligent, broad-minded people of all complexions intermixing and being too occupied otherwise to worry about either their own skin color or the skin color of those around them. Her Uncle Joe had said that Negroes were Negroes, whether they happened to be yellow, brown, or black, and a conscious effort to eliminate the darker elements would neither prove nor solve anything. There was nothing quite so silly as the creed of the blue veins, whiter and whiter every generation. The nearer white you, you are, the more white people will respect you. Therefore, all light Negroes marry light Negroes. Continue to do so generation after generation, and eventually white people will accept this racially bastard aristocracy, thus enabling those Negroes who really matter to escape the social and economic inferiority of the American Negro. Such had been the credo of her grandmother and of her mother and of their small circle of friends in Boise. But Boise was a provincial town given to the molding of provincial people with provincial minds. Boise was a backwoods town out of the mainstream of modern thought and progress. Its peoples were cramped and narrow, their intellectual concepts stereotyped and static. Los Angeles was a, was a happy contrast in all aspects. On registration day, Emma Lou rushed out to the campus of the University of Southern California one hour before the register's office was scheduled to open. She spent the time roaming around, familiarizing herself with the layout of the campus and learning the names of the various buildings, some old and vine clan, others new and shiny in the sun, and watching the crowd of laughing students rushing to and fro, greeting one another and talking over talking over their plans for the coming school year. But her main reason for such an early arrival on campus had been to find some of her fellow Negro students. She had heard that there were quite, uh, there, there, there were to be quite a, a, few, a few numbered enrolled, but in all of her hours strolls, she saw not one. And finally, somewhat disheartened, she got into line, stretched out in front of the register's office. And for the moment, she became engrossed in becoming a college freshman. All the while, though, she kept searching for a colored face, but it was not until she had been duly signed up as a student and sent in search of an advisor that she saw one. Then three colored girls had sauntered into a room where she was having a conference with her advisor, sauntered in, arms interlocked, greeted her advisor, then sauntered out again. Emma Lou had wanted to rush after them to introduce herself, but of course it would have been impossible under the circumstances. She had immediately taken a liking to all three, each of whom was what is known in the parlance of the black belt as high brown with modestly shingled, barbed hair and well-formed body. Fastening attired and flashy sporting sports comments. From then on, Emma Lou paid little attention to the business of choosing subjects in class hours. So little attention, in fact, that the advisor thought her exceptionally trackable and somewhat dumb. But she liked students to come that way. It made the task of being an advisor easy. One just made out the program to suit oneself and had no tedious explanation to make as to why the student could not and could not have such and such subject at such and such an hour and why such and such a professor's class was already full. After a program had been made out, Emma Lou was directed to the bursar's office to pay her fees. While going down the steps, she almost bumped into two dark-skinned boys, obviously brothers if not twins, arguing as to where they should go next. One insisted that they should go back to the registrar's office. The other was being equally insistent that they should go to the gymnasium and make an appointment for their required physical examination. Emma Lou boldly stopped when she saw them hoping they would speak, but they merely glanced up at her and continued their argument, bringing cards and pamphlets out of their pockets for reference and guidance. Emma Lou wanted to introduce herself to them, but she was too bashful to do so. She wasn't yet used to going to school with other Negro students, and she wasn't exactly certain how one went about being, being acquainted, but she finally decided that she had better let the advances come from the others, especially if they were men. If there was nothing more forward about her, then, and since she was a stranger, it would be no more than right that the old-timers would make her welcome. Still, if these had been girls, but they weren't, so she continued her way down the stairs. In the bursar's office, she, had some, she was somewhat overjoyed at first to find she had fallen into line behind another colored girl, 
who, who turned around immediately and after saying hello announced in a harsh, loud voice, my feet are sure some tired. Emma Lou was so taken back that she couldn't answer. People in college don't talk that way. But meanwhile, the girl was continuing. Ain't this registration a mess? Two white girls who had fallen in the line behind Emma Lou snickered. Emma Lou answered by shaking her head. The girl continued, I've been standing in line and climbing stairs and talking and assigning till I'm just about done for. This is, it is tiresome, Emma Lou returned softly, hoping the girl would take a hint and lower her own strident voice, but she didn't. Tiresome ain't the name for it, she declared more loudly than ever before. Then, is you a, a new student? I am, Emma Lou, answered Emma Lou, putting an emphasis on I am. But she wanted the whole people, the white people, who were listening to know that she knew grandma if this other person didn't. Is you indeed? If this girl was a specimen of the Negro students with whom she was to associate, she was most she most certainly did not want to meet another one. But it could but it couldn't be possible that all of them, these three girls and those two boys, for instance, were like this girl. Emma Lou was unable to imagine how such a person had ever gotten out of high school. Where on earth could she have gone to high school? Surely not in the north, that she must be a southerner. That's what she was, a southerner. Emma Lou curled the lips a little. No wonder the colored people in Boise spoke as though uh, spoke as they did about Southern Negroes and wished that they would stay south. Imagine ones preparing to enter college, saying, "Is you," and and to make to make it worse, right before all these white people, make star these staring white people so eager and ready to laugh. Emma Lou's face burned. Two more, then I I goes in my sock. Emma Lou <laughs> was almost at a place where she was ready to take even this statement literally and was on the verge of leaving the line. Suppose this creature did go in her sock. God forbid. Wonder where all the spades keep themselves. I ain't seen but two sides, you. I really do not know, Emma Lou returned precisely and, and, and chillily. She had no intention of becoming friendly with this sort of person. Why would she be ashamed even to be seen? Why she would be ashamed even to be seen on the street with her, dressed as she is in a red striped sports suit, a white hat, and white shoes, and stockings. Didn't she know that black people had to be careful about the colors they affected? The girl had finally reached the bursar's window and was paying her freeze and loudly differing with the cashier about the total amount due. I tell you, it ain't that much, she shouted through the window bars. I figured it up myself before I left home. The cashier obligingly turned to her adding machine and once more obtained the same total. When shown this, the girl merely grinned, examined this closely and said, I'm going to pay it, but I think you're wrong. Finally, she moved away from the window, but not before she turned to Emma Lou and said, You're next! And then proceeded to wait until Emma Lou had finished. Emma Lou vainly sought some way to escape, but it was but it was unable to do so, and no choice but to walk with the girl to the register's office where they had their car stamped in return for the bursar's receipt. This done, they went into the campus together. Hazel Mason was her name. Emma Lou had fully expected it to be either Hassan or Germanium. Geranium. Hazel was from Texas, Prairie View, Texas, and she told Emma Lou that her father having become quite wealthy when oil had been found on his farmlands, had been, had, had been enabled to realize two life ambitions, obtain a Packard touring car and send his only daughter to a, a first-class white school. Emma Lou had planned to loiter around campus. She was still eager to become acquainted with the colored members of the student body, and this encounter with the crass and vulgar Hazel Mason had made her all the more eager, she resented being approached by anyone so fragrantly inferior, anyone so noticeably a typical southern darky who had no business obtruding into a more refined scheme of things. Emma Lou planned to lose her unwelcome companion somewhere on campus so that she could continue unhindered her quest for agreeable acquaintances. But Hazel was as anxious to meet the meet someone as Emma Lou, and, and having found it was not going to let her get away without a struggle. She too was new to this environment, and in a way was more lonely and eager for companionship of her own kind than Emma Lou, for never before had she come into such close contact with so many whites. 
Her life had been spent only among Negroes. Her fellow pupils and teachers in school had always been colored. And as she confessed to Emma Lou, she couldn't get used to all these white folk. Honey, I'm just aching to see a black face, she said. And though Emma Lou was experiencing the same ache, she found herself unable to sympathize with the other girl, for Emma Lou classified Hazel as a barbarian who most certainly did most certainly did not come from a family of best people. No doubt her mother had been a washerwoman. No doubt she had been an she had innumerable relatives and friends, all as ignorant and as ugly as she was. There was no sense in anyone having a face as ugly as Hazel's. And Emma Lou thanked her stars that though she was black, her hair was not rough and pimply, nor was her skin her skin was not rough and pimply, nor was her skin kinky, nor were her nostrils completely flattened out until they seemed to spread out all over her face. No wonder people were prejudiced against dark skinned people when they were uh, when they when they were so ugly, so haphazard in their dress, and so boisterously mannered in their as in this present uh, specimen. She herself was black, but nevertheless she had come from a good family, and she could easily take her place in, in a society of the right sort of people. The two strolled along the lawn bordered gravel paths, which led to a vine-covered building at the end of the campus. Hazel never ceased talking. She kept shouting at Emma Lou, shouting all sorts of personal intimacies as if she were desirous of the whole world hearing them. There was no necessity for her to talk so loudly, no necessity to afford every one of everyone on the crowded campus the, the chance to stare and laugh at them as they passed. Emma Lou had never before been so humiliated and so embarrassed. She felt that she must get away from her offensive companion. What did she care if she had to hurt her feelings to do so? The more insulting she, she could be now, the less friendly she would have to be in the future. Goodbye, she said abruptly. I must go home, with which she turned away and walked rapidly in the opposite direction. She had only gone a few steps when she was aware of the fact that the girl was following her, and she quickened her pace, oh, but the girl caught up with her, grabbing hold of Emma Lou's arm, shouting, Whoa there, Sally! It seemed to Emma Lou as if everyone on campus was viewing and enjoying this minstrel-like performance. Angrily, she tried to jerk away, but the girl held fast. Gal, you sure walk fast. I'm going your way. Come on, let me drive you home in my buggy. And still, and still holding on to Emma Lou's arm, she led the way to the side street where the students parked their cars. Emma Lou was powerless to resist. The girl didn't give her a chance, for she held tight, then immediately resumed the monologue, which Emma Lou's attempted leave-taking had interrupted. They reached the street. Hazel still talking loudly and making elaborate gestures with her free hand. Here we are, she shouted, releasing Emma Lou's hand, salamed on a sports model Schultz roaster. Oscar, she continued, meet the new girlfriend. Pleased to meet you, he says. Climb aboard. And Emma Lou was and and, and and Emma Lou had climbed aboard, perplexed, chagrined, thoroughly angry and disgusted. What was this little black fool doing with a short roadster? And of course it would be painted red. Negroes always bedecked themselves and their belongings in ridiculous, unbecoming colors and ornaments. It seemed to be part of their primitive heritage, which they did not seem to have sense enough to forget and deny. Black girl, white hat, red and white striped sports suit, white shoes and stockings, red roaster. The picture was complete. All Hazel needed to complete her circus-like appearance, thought Emma Lou, was to have some purple, purple feathers stuck in her hat. Still talking, the girl unlocked and proceeded to start the car. As she was backing it out of the narrow parking space, Emma Lou heard a chorus of semi-suppressed giggles from a neighboring automobile. In her anger, she had failed to notice that there were people in the car next to the shorts. But as Hazel expertly swung the machine around, Emma Lou caught glances at them. They were all colored, and they were all staring at her and at Hazel. She thought she recognized one of the girls as being one of the groups she had seen earlier that morning, and she did recognize the two brothers she had passed on the stairs. And as the roadster sped away, their laughter echoed in her ears, although she hadn't actually heard it, and she had seen the strain in their faces. And she knew that as soon as she and Hazel were out of sight, they would give free rein to their suppressed mirth. Although Emma Lou had finished registering, she returned to the university campus 
on the following morning in order to continue her quest for collegiate companions without the alarming and unwelcome presence of Hazel Mason. She didn't know whether to be sorry for the girl and try to help her or to be disgusted and avoid her. She didn't want to be intimately associated with such a vulgar person. It would be damage her own position, cause her to be classified as someone who was in a class by herself, for Emma Lou was certain that they were not and could not be anyone else in the university just like Hazel. But despite her vulgarity, the girl was not all bad. Her good nature was infectious, and Emma Lou had surmised from her monologue on the day before how utterly unselfish a person she could be and was. All of her, st all, all of her store of the world's goods were at hand to be used and enjoyed by her friends. There was, there was not, as she said, a selfish bone in her body. But even that did not alter the disgusting fact that she was not one who would be welcomed by the right sort of people. Her flamboyant style of dress, her loud voice, her anxious laughter, her fragrant disrespect or ignorance of English grammar seemed inexcusable to Emma Lou, who was unable to understand how much a person could stray so far from the environment in which she rightfully belonged to enter a first-class university. Now, Hazel, according to Emma Lou, was the type of Negro who should go to a Negro college. There were plenty of them in the South whose standard of scholarship was not beyond her ability. And then in one of these schools, her darky-like clowniness would not, have been, been, would not have been paraded in front of white people, thereby causing discomfort and embarrassment to others of her race, more civilized and circumspect than she. The problem irritated Emma Lou. She didn't see why it, would, it had to be. She looked forward so anxiously and so happily to her introductory days on campus, and now her first experience of one of her fellow colored students had been an unpleasant one, but she didn't intend to let that make her unhappy. She was determined to return to campus alone, seek out other companions, see whether they accepted or ignored the offending Hazel, and govern, govern herself accordingly. It was early, and there were there were few people on the campus. The grass was still wet from a heavy overdue overnight dew, and the sun had not yet dispelled the coolness of the early morning. Emma Lou's dress was of a thin material, and she shivered as she walked or stood in the shade. She had no school business to attend to. There was nothing for her to do but to walk aimlessly around the campus. In another hour, Emma Lou was pleased to see that the campus walks were becoming crowded and that the side streets surrounding the campus were now heavy with student traffic. Things were beginning to awaken. Emma Lou became jubilant and walked with a jaunty step from path to path, from building to building. Then it occurred to her that she had been told that there were no, there were more Negro students enrolled in the School of Pharmacy than in any other department of the university, so finding the pharmacy building, she began to wander through its crowded hallways. Almost immediately, she saw a group of five students, three boys and two girls, standing near a water fountain. She was both excited and perplexed, excited over the fact that she was so close to those she wished to find, and perplexed because she did not know how to approach them. Had, had there been only one person standing there, the matter would have been comparatively easy. She could have approached with a smile and said, good morning. Then that person would have returned to greeting, and it would have then been a simpler matter to get acquainted. But five people in one bunch, all known to one another and all chatting intimately together, it would seem too much like an intrusion to go bursting into their gathering, too forward and too vulgar. Then there was nothing she could say after having said Good morning. One just didn't break into a group of five and say, Hey, I'm Emma Lou Morgan, a new student. I want to make friends with you. No, she couldn't do that. She would just smile as she passed, smile graciously and friendly. They would know that she was a stranger, and her smile would assure them that she was anxious to make friends, anxious to become a welcome addition to their group. One of the group of five cited Emma Lou as soon as she cited them. Who's this? queried Helen Wheaton, a senior in the College of Law. Some new pick, I guess, answered Bob Armstrong, who was Helen's fiance and a senior in the School of Architect. I bet she's going to take pharmacy, whispered Amos Bland. She, she hotten enough to take something, mumbled Tommy Brown. Thank God she won't be in any of our classes, eh, Moses? Emma Lou was abreast of them now. They lowered their voices and made a pretense of mumbled conversation among themselves. 
Only Vern Davis looked directly at her, and it was she alone who, who returned Emma Lou's smile. What you grinning at, Bob chided Vern as Emma Lou passed out of earshot. At that little frosh, of course, she grinned at me. I couldn't stare at her without returning it. I don't see how anybody could even look at her without grinning. Oh, she's not so bad, said Vern. Uh, she's bad enough. That makes two of them. Two of what, Amos? Hot and tights, Bob? Good grief, exclaimed Tommy. Why don't you recruit some good-looking co-eds out there? Why don't you choose them, Helen returned. I'm going out to the southern branch where the sight of my fellow students won't give me dysteria. Ta-ta, Amos, said Vern, and you needn't bother to sit in my car anymore if you think us so terrible. She and Helen walked away, leaving the boys to discuss the sad days which had fallen upon the campus. Emma Lou, of course, knew, knew, knew nothing of this. She had gone her way rejoicing. One of the students had noticed her and returned to smile. This, jet, this getting acquainted was going to be an easy matter after all. It was just necessary that she exercise a little patience. Women expect people to fall all over one another without some preliminary advance. It's true, she was a stranger, but she would show them in good time that she was worthy of their attention, that she was a good fellow and a well-bred individual quite prepared to be accepted by the best people. She strolled out on campus again, trying to find more prospective acquaintances. The sun was warm now, the grass dry and the campus overcrowded. There was an infectious germ of youth and gladness abroad to which Emma Lou could not remain immune. Already she was certainly, already she was, already, she, excuse me, already she was certain that she felt this presence of that vague something known as the college spiritist or as college spirit, it seemed to enter into her, to make her jubilant, to set her nerves tingling. This was no time for sobriety. It, it was time for youth's blood to run hot, the time for love and sport and wholesome fun. Then Emma Lou saw a solitary Negro girl seated on the stone bench. It did not take her a second to decide what to do. Here was a chance. She would make friends with this girl, and she should happen. And and should she happen to be a new student, they could become friends and together find their way into the inner circle of these colored students who really mattered. Emma Lou was essentially a snob. She had absorbed this trait from the very people who had sought to exclude her from their presence. All her life, she had heard talk of the right sort of people and of the people who really mattered. And, and from these phrases, she had formed a mental Im image of those whom she to those whom they applied. Hazel Mason, Mason most certainly could not be included in either of these categories. Hazel was just a vulgar little nigger from down south. It was her kind who, when they came to the north, made it hard for, for the colored people already resident there. It was her kind who knew nothing of the social niceties of the or polite conversation. In their own homes, they had been used only to coarse work and coarser manners. They had been forbidden. They had been forbidden to the chance to have an intimate contact in schools and in public places with white people from whom they might absorb some semblance of culture. When they did come north and get a chance to go to white schools, white theaters, and white libraries, they were too unused to them to, to appreciate what they were getting and could be expected to continue their old way of life and environment with such a way was decidedly out of place. Emma Lou was determined to become associated only with those people who really mattered. Northerners like herself were superior Southerners. If there were any who were different from the whites only in so far as skin color was concerned, this girl to whom she was now about to introduce herself was a type she had in mind, genteel, well, and tastefully dressed, and not ugly. Good morning, Alma Martin looked up from a book that she was reading and gulped in surprise, and then answered, good morning. Emma Lou sat down on the bench. She was congenial itself. Are you a new student, she inquired, of the astonished Alma? who wasn't used to this sort of thing. No, I'm a soft, then realizing she was expected to say more. You're new, aren't you? Oh, yes, replied Emma Lou, her voice buoyant and glad. This will be my first year. Do you think you'll like it? I'm just crazy about her already, you know. The, she advanced confidentially. I've never gone to a school with any colored people before. No, and I'm just dying to get acquainted with some colored student. And my name is Emma Lou Morgan, and mine's Alma Martin. They both laughed. There was a moment of silence. 
I'm going to look at her wristwatch and got up from the bench. I'm glad to have met you. I got to see my advisor at 1030. Goodbye. And she moved away gracefully. And I'm going to I'm going to end the reading with that with that line at 60 minutes of reading of the black black of the berry. We learned a little bit about Emma Lou Morgan, didn't we? 